Ja, dames en heren, welkom terug in stream 1 met de lezingen over de boerenlandvogels. Een term die eigenlijk pas vrij recent is opgekomen omdat we uh, zijn afgestapt van alleen maar kijken naar weidevogels of akkervogels. Maar nu vooral in willen zetten op uh, de vogels van het agrarisch cultuurlandschap. En daar hebben we de term boerenlandvogels voor bedacht. Uh, Sofon heeft ook kort geleden samen met de Bond van Friese Vogelwachten en Landschappen en heel de Boerland Vogelbalans uitgebracht. En dat geeft een vrij goed, maar helaas best wel treurig beeld over de situatie van boerenlandvogels in Nederland. En een van de soorten die dat helaas het beste illustreert is de zomertortel. Een soort die toch bij velen een beetje tussen de wal en het schip is geraakt. Maar die gelukkig nu, en er is alle reden voor, veel aandacht gaat krijgen in de komende lezing. We zijn heel blij dat Jennifer Vreugdenhil Rowlands, een zelfstandig gevestigd ornitholoog, actief als ringer in het Zeelse bij de ringgroepen Nebularia en zeeland Saftingen ons vandaag mee gaat nemen in uh, haar onderzoek, haar uh, nieuwe onderzoek naar de dwel en wee van de turteldoof, de zomertortel. Zij gaat haar verhaal in het Engels houden, want ze is van Engelse origine. En ik wil je ook vragen, als je vragen in de chat hebt, bij voorkeur in het Engels stellen. Dan gaan we daar straks nader op in. Maar ik geef nu het woord aan Jennifer Vreugdeel Rowlands. Jennifer. Thank you for the introduction. Um, welcome to Turtle Doves in a Changing Landscape. I'm Jenny, and uh, the last few years I've been focusing my attention as an ecologist and bird ringer onto the turtle dove. So we all know that the turtle dove is not doing so well. Um, but the question is, how bad is that exactly? Well, I can tell you that in the Netherlands, since the 1970s, we've seen a 97% decline in the population. Now, maybe a generation ago, you could hear turtle doves almost anywhere in the landscape, but that has changed. They've gone from being quite a common species to a pretty rare species. And the predictions are that they will be extinct within five to 10 years in the Netherlands. And we know that this is a problem that's not only for the Netherlands, but it's an international pr problem. The turtle dove is a species that is uh, migratory, so they breed here in the Netherlands, for example, and in other parts of Europe, and in the winter they migrate down to Africa. This problem of population decline can be seen across their whole range, um, and because it's an international problem, the European Condi Commission and the RSPB have written an international single species action plan for the European turtle dove. This looks at the causes for decline, as well as some of the actions that different countries need to be taking to overcome the problems. So in this presentation, I'd like to discuss some of the reasons for their decline. I'd like to consider what we are doing in the Netherlands and look at what's happening abroad. And furthermore, what needs to happen to stop the extinction of the species. So the turtle dove, as I've mentioned, is a migratory dove. It's the only migrating dove in the Netherlands. And I'd like to use the example of Jos. This is Jos. Um, he's, a, he's one of the turtle doves that is a part of our migration research study. Um, he is carrying a satellite tag, and he was ringed here in, Vol uh, here in the Netherlands on Volgeren in Zeeland. And we we're able to follow him with, uh, with the help of an online live map. Um, you can find this on www.zomatortles.nl if you'd like to join us in watching where he is at the moment. Um, so I'd like to take a look at some of the problems that he has faced on this last migration, uh, starting with habitat loss in his breeding grounds. Then he meets legal hunting, illegal hunting. He has to cross the Sahara, which, although is not technically a problem, it is a, a big obstacle for all birds that have to migrate across, uh, across Africa. And then finally, when he reaches his, his wintering grounds, then he faces more problems with habitat loss. So starting in the breeding areas, uh, Jos spends from roughly May until September in Volgere. I have here a couple of photos, which you're probably all familiar with already, of some of the farming changes that have happened over the last 60 years. So as you can see, the most noticeable part is that agriculture has intensified. The photo from the 1950s has much more small-scale landscape. It has a lot of field edges, a lot of borders. It has a lot of hedgerows, probably 
ditches and ponds, and these have all been drained and removed to make way for some of the bigger fields that we see nowadays. In addition to these changes in the landscape, there has also been an increase in the use of agricultural chemicals, such as herbicides. Since the turtle dove is predominantly a seed eater and used to eat predominantly agricultural weeds, this has obviously produced some real problems in food shortages for them. So what's being done in the breeding areas? Um, the first thing we can see is that there have been more turtle dove conservation organisations appearing. Operation Turtle Dove in the UK, uh, Operatie Zomertortel, you've probably heard of from Vogelbescherming in the, in the Netherlands. There have also been some national action plans coming up, um, particularly in Belgium and I think France as well. And these should hopefully be coming into action as of 2021. There's also been a lot of focus on the development of new land management packages and landscape management advice um, from organisations such as Operation Turtle Dove. And there's also been an increase in research over the whole of Europe, but also in some of the African countries. You'll see I've put a whole load of logos on this slide. Um, these are just a few of the organisations that are all trying to work and trying to make a difference for the turtle dove. So in September, Jos will go on. Uh, Jos has left on. Jos left on migration, um, and then the first thing he will encounter is legal hunting. So hunting is still legal in the European Union, as well as extensive parts of Eastern Europe and across the whole of Africa. Um, the first country that Jos will come up against is France. And we all heard probably through the news that there, is a, there was a lot of uh, media coverage over a quota of 17,000 birds, turtle doves, that could be shot this year, this hunting season. Thankfully, um, BirdLife France, uh, the LPO, and the public uh, had action against this, and there was a government consultation held in, uh, at the end of August, and within two weeks the government had stopped and suspended the hunting in, uh, of turtle doves for this season. Uh, unfortunately, those, during those two weeks that it took the decision to be made, more than 7,000 of the allocated 17,000 turtle doves were already shot. Jos, as it happens, got lucky. He only left the Netherlands on the 17th of September and made full use of the, the hunting ban. Now, it's not only legal hunting that Jos will come up against, but also illegal hunting. This, in its nature, of course, is much harder to monitor, harder to control, and there is, of course, little data available. No one's going to publish if they've illegally shot birds. This makes it very difficult to track. So once Jos crosses the Sahara, he arrives at his wintering grounds in the Sahel. And then he faces more problems with habitat loss here. Increasing population has meant increased cultivation, an intensification of agriculture, and problems with overgrazing. This has led to the disturbance of roosting sites, loss of water, loss of trees. And this photo here that you can see is an example of uh, the map the, the online map where Yoss is at the moment. Each of these points is a place where Yoss has been recorded. This is actually in Mali, and as you can see, the, the focus of his activity is around an area with green trees and water. So in addition to all the problems he faces along his flyway, he's also faced with the constant challenge of disease, namely trichomonas. This is a really common disease in a lot of birds, and particularly bad when it comes to doves and pigeons. It causes lesions in the throat and in the mouth, and these eventually lead to starvation and suffocation. While we don't know exactly what the impact of this is on the overall turtle dove population, we do know that it's incredibly easy to spread. Uh, it's spread uh, through bird-to-bird -bird contacts, for example at feeding stations, even in perhaps your garden, or on, on the, uh, in the landscape. It can be passed from adults to baby birds, it can be passed between uh, birds that are partners. Um, our knowledge of this has meant that there have been alterations to the supplementary feeding protocols in both the UK and the Netherlands to try and decrease the intensity with which doves come to feed. So this is quite a quick summary of the main problems, but the question is, what are we doing in the Netherlands? Well, there has been an emergency supplementary feeding program rolled out by Operatie Zomertortel from Vogelbescherming. That's the bird life in the Netherlands. 
In addition, we've been doing some research over the last few years into the migration overwintering uh, areas of this species and into their foraging habitat. Breeding habitat loss is, of course, one of the only things that we are really able to directly influence from here. So the first question, what do they need? They need somewhere to nest, in scrub or trees. They need access to water. They need access to food, so seeds, um, particularly before and after migration to build up their condition. And they need areas to winter. Um, most of their roosting sites are found in trees and scrub. Foraging areas for this species are generally very open. As you can see from this photo, you've got a, a wheat field and next to it you've got ideal foraging habitat for a turtle dove. It's very open, very sparse, low vegetation, hopefully with a high seed availability throughout the year. So the habitat research. To investigate more about the habitat use in the Netherlands, research was started in 2018. We've spent two years tagging five different birds, who you can see here. The first four birds were all from 2019, and then in 2020 we tagged Bram. Uh, Bram. <laughs> He's, uh, he was one that we were able to follow the entire season, whereas the other birds we only got to follow for a few weeks or a few months. So safety first. Um, because... Uh, only satellite tags have been used in other European countries for research and radio technology has been used in the UK. This was actually the first time that GPS tags have been used um, to look at habitat use by this species in so much detail. There are several precautions that we took. Um, the advised weight for a tag is between 3 and 5%, depending on where you read. We went for the more precautionary 3%. It means that including the harness and the weight of the aluminium ring, the total weight uh, of the bird was going to be up to 5%, not more. We attached the tags like a backpack, and the birds only had to be caught once during the season because the tags allowed for remote transmission. So I have to stand within range, and then all of the data gets sent to my laptop. We also wanted to trial the harnesses. Um, before, uh, before we actually went loose on the, on the wild birds. So we tested them out at an aviary. Uh, we tested the, the harness design on several different birds to make sure we could really attach it as quickly and as safely as possible. And we've actually kept one of the dummy tags on a bird in this aviary. They've been flying around for about 21 months now and they have shown no adverse effects, either behaviorally or physically. So this is an overall summary of all of the data that we collected over the last two years. There's more than 2,000 locations registered from the five, the, the five different birds. And the little table at the bottom shows that uh, the number of days that each bird was followed and the total number of points each bird was able to give us. As you can see, some of the birds were followed for just a very short period of time. And then in the case of Brum, we had the good fortune this year of being able to follow him the entire season. So a day in the life of Bernard. Um, this is just one snapshot from our data. This is a single day of Bernard, who is a territorial male without a nest. I've marked out here his territory and a dairy farm, which is one of his registered feeding sites. As you can see, he spends most of his time within his territory, making just one foraging trip to the dairy farm and a couple of other sites. He flies about 3.5 kilometers on this day. But it's quite interesting to note that he actually threw up to five, flew up to five kilometers away to, uh, to a grass seed factory, which, if you ask me, is a pretty smart choice for a bird looking for a seed. This is a whole week's worth of data from Bram. This is the dove that we followed in 2020. And he was a territorial male with an active nest. So the circled area is where the nest is. And as you can see, over the course of the entire week, he stayed much closer to his nesting site and territory. He flew only one kilometre away for food. So we found four different uh, territories. They were all in small-scale landscapes, extensively managed with a lot of landscape features. In 2020, we found two different nests, but they were both from Brum, different points of the year, uh, of the breeding season. And this photo here um, 
On the left-hand side, in the scrub just behind the row of trees, is the location of one of the nests. And as you can see, it is indeed a small-scale landscape. There are seven different types of habitat within 20 metres of the nest, which is really important for breeding turtle doves because the young stay within 20 metres of the nest site once they have fledged. It's essential that they've got a source of food and water close to their nesting site. So where do they forage? Well, in 2019, we found 29 different foraging sites. Most of them were in small-scale landscapes, which had lots of bare ground, weeds, lots of field edges, and plenty of landscape features, such as tracks, hedges, and water. In areas where there was int intensive agriculture, then the general um, the turtle dove activity was much more focused on areas where it was less intense. I've got two great maps here, which really illustrate this very well. The top one is um, the edge of two fields, a sugar beet field and a potato field. And the lower map is from an orchard. And as you can see, turtle dove activity at these sites is, in, is very concentrated around the areas where there is tracks, weeds and a lot of bare ground. It's unlikely that these foraging sites are optimal habitat for foraging turtle doves, but it might provide the best habitat in the vicinity. There were several sites where the behaviour dif differed. These fell into two very rough categories. The first category was seed made available by human influence, such as um, food stored for cows or spilt on a farmyard. The second category was uh, crop fields, which had a very high seed availability, for example, around harvest time. We saw a general trend that turtle doves were visiting the human uh, sites much more frequently earlier on in the season. Here's an example of one of our, uh, our human influence sites. This is a dairy farm that was visited in May. There are two different colours of points. They represent, in this case, two different birds. This is Omi and Bernard. And as you can see, there are different clusters of, round of turtle dove activity around the site. There's quite a lot of activity around the trees. Um, and the trees that are in the photos are... I, I don't have a point for this presentation. <laughs> the trees in the photos are just next to a manure heap and an area of paved uh, farmyard. There is also a pool, and we actually saw a wagtail drinking here at this, uh, this pool with the gently sloping sides. So it's quite likely the turtle doves were using this as a drinking site. And the lower photo is uh, that matches up with the lower points in the map, those two silage channels where the food for the cows is stored. As you can see, the open channel has a lot more points in it. Um, there was a lot more food available here, of course. It was uh, chopped up maize. This next site I'd like to share is a blue poppy seed field. Um, in this case, the points represent two different timings. The bird is called Henk, and the before harvest points are in yellow. And as you can see, he really hugs the lines where the tractors go. If you look at that, uh, that top photo, you can see clearly why. The dense vegetation is just much too thick for him to walk through and forage in. But where those tractor lines are, there's a lot of bear and easy access to the, to the weeds and to the crop itself. After harvest is shown in the green points. And you can see that he clearly uses then the entire field. The lower photo tells you exactly why. It's incredibly open, short vegetation. There's probably an awful lot of fallen seed left over after harvest. This stubble is incredibly valuable for turtle doves. And to illustrate the, uh, the use of stubble, stubble as, a, as, a for, uh, as a foraging site before migration, I've got here a wheat field. The, the green, if you look at the map, the green area shows chicory. Um, that's Witlof for, uh, for Dutch out there. And the edge is then in wheat, that's orange. As you can see, he has no interest at all in the chicory crop, but he is very interested in the stubble. If you look at the larger photo, you can actually see that there's a lot of fallen wheat that has not been harvested. This is exactly what makes these things ideal. Previous research has also shown that the dietary shift from agricultural weeds to more crop-based diet. Um, this is really well illustrated in this research. 
they are very much dependent on these human sites earlier in the season and then on human activity later in the season. It's also interesting to note that none of the turtle doves we followed showed any interest at all in the planted field borders from agri-environment schemes. I have here two photos. One is an ANL Bay field edge in the Netherlands within 500 meters of a turtle dove territory. As you can probably imagine, this is incredibly dense. It's not ideal habitat. It's uh, for foraging turtle doves. It's much too high. On the right-hand side, I've got a second photo, which is the advise, advised foraging habitat from, an op, from Operation Turtle Dove in the UK. As you can see, there is a big difference. Low vegetation, sparse, a lot of bear. Um, the results from our, uh, from our research certainly seem to support this, uh, this observation. So what have we learned from our research? Small-scale landscapes are preferred for both foraging and nesting. They're incredibly important, both in terms of how many landscape elements there are, scrub, unmanaged hedge, taller trees and ponds, and in the different variety of land uses available, everything from verges through to field borders and tracks. These small-scale landscapes used to be much more common in the 1960s. The second observation is that the existing agri-environment scheme borders don't seem to be suitable for turtle doves. They might help a lot of other farmland birds, but they are just not right for doves. Our third observation is that turtle doves are using sites where the seed is spilt or stored by humans much earlier in the year. This suggests that there is a real food shortage in this earlier time of year. The fourth observation was that turtle doves are heavily impacted by humans. Not only our sowing times, but also the harvesting times, the ploughing times. Where are the tractor marks? Where are the weeds being sprayed? Where are they available? Where is the... Uh, where is the stubble? You can really see a concentration of turtle dove activity around these areas. The increase in suitable of, of suitable vegetation is quite likely to improve the overall habitat for turtle doves. And what do turtle doves need to avoid extinction? In the breeding grounds, this really calls for a bit of a restoration on small scale landscapes and a higher seed availability throughout the year. Um, we need more landscape features and a mosaic of habitats coming back. And this could be, for example, in the form of better suited agri-environment schemes, better suited edge, uh, edges full of weeds and weed rich, uh, seed, -rich, seed rich weeds would, uh, would decrease the reliance of turtle doves on humans. There is also a need for more research into what kind of agri-environment schemes would actually suit the turtle doves best. What are they eating at the moment? What do they need? and what the impact of disease is. It's also really important that, as the Dutch, we actually support um, hunting bans in other countries. While we don't hunt in this country, um, France is a prime example of where the public has had a very big impact on, uh, uh, the public has had a very big impact on stopping the hunting, even if it's only temporarily. Internationally, there's a lot of focus on better management for hunting. We need to ban the hunting, even if this is for a temporary uh, period until the, the turtle dove population is stabilized. We need to find a better way to stop illegal hunting of tracking and prosecuting these. And equally important, we need to identify and protect stopover areas and roosting areas and protect these. There's also a need for more research into the overwintering habitat requirements of turtle doves. So before I finish, just as a, a quick last slide, I wanted to share a new project with you. This is one that is being set up with the partners that you can see down the bottom of the screen. Um, we are hoping to look into different land management options for turtle doves. We'd like to look at the field edges and try different seed mixes and management methods. And we would like to use cameras, observations, and GPS tags to identify which sites the turtle doves are preferring. Hopefully, we'll be able to implement some of these measures in the Netherlands into our um, ANLB schemes. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, Jenny, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And of course, please take along this when you leave the room. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, but not now, because there are quite a few questions rising up from your 
from your paper, and uh, you already expected that when we had yes. a chat before this <laughs> yeah. lecture. They're not too difficult, I hope. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, with uh, some of the questions. Um, there is a question from. Um, the north of Limburg, the province of Limburg, mm -hmm. um, just south of Nijmegen, they, there are still quite a few breeding turtle doves. What can they do as Vogelwerkgroep Rijk van Nijmegen to support and protect these birds? Oh, that is an excellent question. Yes. Um, what could a Vogelwerkgroep do? I would say... At the moment, I think it's really important that you join uh, any schemes that are available in the Netherlands. So at the moment, look into what Vogelbescherming is doing with Operatie Zomertortel. Um, try and get as many people involved on the emergency feeding uh, protocol as possible. I think that's a great starting point. Although it's only a short-term solution, um, while we're looking for the more lo longer-term solutions, it is a really important first step to make sure that the remnant population still has enough seed. Um, something else that would really be worth doing is encouraging as many farmers as possible to leave their stubble. If you can leave it until, say, the end of September, when almost all the turtle doves will have already migrated south, this would also give them as many opportunities for, for foraging as possible before they leave. I think at the moment, until more is known about uh, what sort of uh field edges, can be implemented, um, I think this is probably the best advice I've got at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Has the Royal Dutch Hunting Association taken any action to stop the French sister organization? Do you happen not to know that? Not that I'm aware of. Not that you are aware of. Okay. Yeah. They, they might have done, but that's not something I know about. Them. Okay. Um, you showed um, a couple of individual turtle doves that you have managed to capture mm -hmm. and to equip with, uh, with loggers. What is the reason that only male turtle doves are followed? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> okay. Maybe they're not as smart as the female ones. <laughs> now, we, we actually uh, we caught one female uh, as part of our satellite tracking study. Uh, two turtle doves were caught on that research, Jos and Yozine. Um, but Yozine is indeed the only female turtle dove we have caught. I do not know the reason. In, uh, in the German research, it seems a lot more balanced, male and female. I can't explain it. Sorry. <laughs> And one of the males didn't have an active nest. It, does it indicate that they, there are some imbalance between males and females, probably? Possible. It's not something you can, you can tell, of course, just by looking at a tracker. Um, we only had, uh, only Bram caught in 2020 actually had two active nests. The four doves that we caught in 2019, um, one of them had completed an active nest and Linden, the young dove that we caught, was actually flying around with him. So we're thinking that was probably a fledgling from the other one. So he had already had an active nest. And then two of the other males actually left before the breeding season was really underway. So you can speculate as to why that was. Maybe they were migrating further north or to other areas. Maybe they didn't have a female. Maybe they were out competing each other. We just don't know that sort of information from the tags. Okay. Um, what would your advice be to change first in the large-scale agricultural landscape in terms of landscape elements? Um, I think the best thing we can probably do is to get the INL Bay uh, packages more suited for turtle doves, either in adapting the management for them um, or changing the seed mix very slightly from what it currently is to allow seed availability throughout the year. So this is actually what our new research is going to be on, and we're really hoping then to be able to roll out this on a much larger scale, of course, based on the results of this research. So at the moment, all we've got to go on is the research that's being done uh, parallel in the UK uh, into the different types of habitat that are suitable. Um, but as for actually implementing it in the Netherlands, I think this would be the first step to find out what they need, how we can adapt uh, the farming better for this. Okay, thank you. And the last one. What about the impact of the use of many different pesticides and herbicides? We don't actually know what the impact is. Um, 
The use of herbicides is, of course, to reduce agricultural weeds. And we do know that from, uh, from earlier studies in the 1960s, this is basically the bulk of the diet of a turtle dove is agricultural weeds. Um, so, of course, the use of herbicides is going to reduce weed availability, which in turn has a massive impact on where they can find their food. We've already seen a shift, as I mentioned, from, uh, from these agricultural weeds to more crop-based, but that does also mean they're more reliant on humans. So although we don't know the actual impact in terms of numbers or different herbicides, we know that it has had an impact on the, on the overall diet of the turtle dove. Okay. Thank you very much uh, also for your excellent talk and all the listeners. Thank you for all your questions. We zien elkaar weer over ongeveer een kwartier. Dank jullie wel.